Father of glory, what a beautiful privilege, Father, to be in your presence. Father, we thank you for the congregation, for the fellowship of sons and daughters of God that you have put together, Father. Father, we thank you for this fellowship. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that is at work in this place. Father, we thank you for the love that just moves through us, Father. Father, we are just grateful for your presence among us, for how you have called us from death to life, and you have brought us to this place, and you have woven us together, Father, to be one body. Today, Father, we're asking you for Adam and for Trister, Father. We ask you that your presence comes upon them. Father, that your revelation flows through their lips. Father, that we're able to grasp where you're taking us, the direction that you have set for us. You are our perfect husband, and we want to follow you wherever you go. We thank you, Father, and we remain in your presence. Amen. Oh, are you guys ready? I know Teresa and I are ready. We got to know you're ready. Come on, that's all I want to see. That's right. Good evening, LCM. Today is Thursday, January 19th, 2023. Church, we are excited to share a message with you that is strengthening, encouraging, and emboldening us to new heights. New heights of standing up and setting out. Now, on Sunday, we heard about Joshua standing up in his identity, transparency, strategy, and dependency. Our pastors reminded us through the life of Joshua that the first thing that needs to happen is we stand up. Y'all remember that? Yeah. 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 It has inspired, stirred us, motivated us, and moved us to action. We must stand up first in order to set out. Standing up first breathes not only confidence in ourselves, but also in the brothers around us. Turn with us to our first scripture as we begin this process tonight. Are you guys fired up tonight? Yeah. Look, we are so fired. Adam and I were so excited for this that when we were studying the back, I literally peed myself a little bit. That's embarrassing, but it happened. True story. We could stand up here tonight and preach for three hours and it would feel like 30 minutes. But to save you guys the pain of hearing our voices for three hours, man, we're going to try to get through this. Come on, man. If you leave tonight uninspired, unmotivated, you are either not breathing or you have already checked out in the kingdom. I promise if you stay with us tonight, you're going to get a fresh fire of motivation for the kingdom. You guys ready for that? Look, the title of our message tonight is We Are More. Come on. We are more. Yeah. Let's go to Hebrews 10, 23. And this is going to be in the uh, swish. Shout out. That's right. And let us hold unwaveringly to the hope that we confess. For the one who made the promise is trustworthy. And let us take thought of how to spur one another on to love and good works. Not abandoning our own meetings as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and even more so because you see the day drawing near. Now, I can't help. Carlos Reda is in the house. We are meeting together, and he is spurring us on. Okay, There is confidence because my brother is in the house right now, and I see him standing like a man of God that he is. We also have Elder Charlie and Miss Joe back in the house. Come on. It's a good day when the elders come back. Yeah. Elder Bajadar is also back from his trips over in Romania. It is an exciting time in our house to encourage and spur one another on to good works and good deeds. Look, tonight we're going to dig into 2 Kings 18 and 19. What we're going to dig into is the story of Hezekiah and Sennacherib. Now, the reason we're digging into this story is because 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, We ought to do these things in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Most of the time in this war, the enemy is not looking to develop a full attack, a full frontal, a physical attack on you. 
Most of the time, the enemy knows that if he can catch you up in psychological warfare, if he can get you to quit, if he can get you to let yourself down and let the king down, he's already won. He doesn't need to attack you with anything else. So what we're going to do is we're going to dig into 2 Kings 18. Because what it does is it helps us see the schemes of the enemy as it's active in our lives and active in our minds daily. We're going to look at this story and engage with it. Because what the enemy does in this story is the exact same thing that the enemy does to us every single day. Now before we do that, we want to give you some context about what's going on in this chapter. Most of us with our Western mind think of the 300 Spartans and the Battle of Thermopylae as the turning point in Eastern and Western history. Most of us would tend to think that battles like the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, where the 101st Airborne was surrounded by several panzer divisions and they survived as a turning point in history. What most failed to recognize is that what we are going to read tonight is probably the most pivotal turning point in all of history. What has happened is the Assyrian army, the mightiest army that has ever been, has destroyed literally every other foreign power that has stood in their way. They have already crushed Israel, the northern kingdom. They have already begun to invade Judah. And only Jerusalem stands. Only the city of Jerusalem lasts. They are the last ones. And you know what happens? They're outnumbered probably 20 to 1. You know what happens if the Jews in Jerusalem lose? It has ramifications for the entire course of human history. If the Jews lose this battle, there is no Judaism. They all get wiped out. If there is no Judaism, there is no Jewish Messiah to be born. If there is no Jewish Messiah, there is no gospel that goes around the world. Think about that in a world of Islam. Rising up in the 600, 600s AD. If there is no Christianity, there is no Protestant Reformation. If there's no Protestant Reformation, there is no America, there is no West as we know it. So this battle has the highest stakes that could ever be imagined in human history. Imagine that kind of pressure. I know that you can imagine that kind of pressure because oftentimes we find ourselves in a hard work situation and we literally think we're going to die. Use a Calve Comer on that. This is a thousand times more pressure. To give you some backdrop, 2 Kings 18.5 says that Hezekiah was a man that trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. So what we're talking about is not a man who's lost. We're not talking about a man who's half-hearted or half-devoted. We're talking about a man that trusted in the Lord. And this man is going to face some of the most sinister, some of the most demonic and demoralizing attacks that has ever been faced. 2 Kings 18.13 also gives us some context. In 2 Kings 18.13, it tells us that even though Hezekiah was a man that trusted in the Lord with all of his heart, Assyria is a problem and he bends to actually paying tribute to the king of Assyria. This is a man that trusted in God, but he's in a position where he is actually giving himself over as a servant to a foreign power. You need to know that because it sets up what happens next. You see, when you give yourself over to a foreign power in any capacity in your life, it opens the door for all kinds of demonic attacks. So we're going to start our story in 2 Kings 18 verse 17. And we're going to read on to the end of 18. You guys with us? The king of Assyria sent his supreme commander, his chief officer, and his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. They came up to Jerusalem and stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the washerman's field. They called for the king and Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to them. Now, there's something interesting that we get to see here. The enemy knows them by name. 
is intimate with who they are. Imagine how close you got to be to know someone's name from a different land. Imagine the, the closeness of knowing that that is what the enemy knows about us, knows about things that we do, what we say, how we interact with other people, is aware and knows about our intimate personality, our intimate traits, right? The devil's a, a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He is out and about in a very real present state. You see, the enemy knows you by name as well. He watches everything that you do. He knows the things that you say. He knows the thing that you talk about. He is a smart enemy, and he is not uh, unintelligent. Your enemy, the devil and Satan, knows exactly what to put before you. He knows exactly if he can get you to think this, it might get you to fail. Let's pick up in verse 19. The field commander, this is the Assyrian commander, said to them, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king of Assyria says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? This is the number one question that the enemy asks every single time. This is the number one point of attack that the enemy always tries to attack you with. What is the basis of this confidence that you have? Your confidence is the number one thing that the enemy starts to attack first. The number one strategy of Satan is to wither your confidence. On what basis do you have confidence in what is going on in this church? On what basis do you have confidence in what's going on in your family? On what basis do you have confidence to keep going and persevering until you see the work done and see the work finished? Yeah, in this house, we are built upon a firm foundation. We know that. There is a rock upon which our church sits, and we stand upon in what we, we know, what we've been taught, what we hold so dear to us. That is that firm foundation. But what about when it's not? What about when that confidence starts to drift a little bit? We start to waver in some of our thoughts. That's more like shit. That's more like sifting sand underneath our feet, okay? To give you guys some context and clarity of where our confidence lies versus when we are unconfident. That sand beneath our feet isn't so sturdy. We're not so sure about what we're doing anymore. See, that's why you might be able to go to bed one night and feel like you've really done something in the kingdom, like it was an awesome day. I witnessed to this person. I pastored my wife. And then you wake up the next morning and you're not quite sure you have this weird feeling like everything's going to fade and crumble. It's because you don't realize the number one thing the enemy is trying to crush is your confidence. That is the one thing he's after. So verse 20, you say you have strategy and military strength, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? How about all these, uh, the scriptures that we stand on? We have these awesome things called stones. We do. What about our mezuzah? Huh? There are some fiery men and women of God in here that I know stand up strong in their mezuzah. What about your family banner? Your remembers. What happens when you have an enemy that talks to you about those being empty promises? What happens when they're just fancy ideas and they have never worked or never will at all? It's a lie, but wrestle with that. Wrestle with that thought. Yeah, you see, it's easy to say that it's a lie now, but how many times have you, have you been asking yourself, Man, is my mezuzah really working? Is my mezuzah, is it, is it even God inspired? See, the enemy wants you to believe that the things that you've said, that you are standing on, is just empty words. He wants you to believe you said it in boldness. You came down here and prayed it. You came down here and confirmed it with the pastors and elders, but that was just a lie. It's just empty words coming out of your mouth. It will never happen. It will never work. It has never worked, and it will never work. Take a look at the next attack of the enemy. In verse 21. Look now. You are depending on Egypt. That splintered reed of a staff. 
which pierces a man's hand and wounds him if he leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. What you need to know about this passage is that Hezekiah actually was allied with Egypt. And you remember in the law when God said, do not go back that way? Do not ally yourselves with Egypt? Hezekiah did it. You know what the enemy's doing here? He's pointing out the areas that Hezekiah is getting wrong to wither his confidence. He's actually doing it wrong, but the enemy's going to shove it in his face and make him look at it so that he thinks he can't ever get it right. You know what, Hezekiah, you might as well give up because you're getting it wrong right now. You see, there are areas in our lives where we're actually getting things wrong. You know what the voice of God does? The voice of God says, you can crush this. We can defeat this together. You know what the voice of the enemy says? Look at you. You are screwing up so royally. In fact, you haven't told anybody about it. You are such a screw-up that you might as well quit. You know what? You might as well open up your gates and just let me in because I'm going to get into your kingdom anyway. That is what the enemy floods our minds with. He tries to wither your confidence by making you look at the things that you are doing wrong. Church, the things we are doing wrong will get right. In the kingdom of God, they are not setbacks. They're opportunities to grow. Verse 22, and if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord, our God, isn't he the one whose high, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem. How about, uh, if we remember the story about Hezekiah, he's so far as a king, like no other king that's been there, right? He does the right thing by destroying all the strongholds and the high places and the places of worship that are there. Those places of worship were actually places of worship to Yahweh. And he removed them because God said the only place they should worship is in Jerusalem. Yeah. So he does this because he's God-fearing. Now, what happens when the enemy tells you that what you did wasn't worth anything? What Hezekiah did was the right thing. And yet the enemy is going back, hey, didn't he do all this? Your God? Didn't he take down all those, those altars that you guys are worshiping at? That was your God, right? Making him second guess. Think that it was meaningless. Make him feel like a hypocrite. Or a walking contradiction. Those times when you say one thing and everybody sees you do another. You see, what's happening is the enemy is trying to get Hezekiah to misinterpret what he actually did for the Lord. Hey, you say you serve God, but you remove God's altars. Mm -hmm. So what's going on here? You say one thing, you do one thing, you're just a hypocrite. You're just a big, fat hypocrite that nobody will ever follow. You're a walking contradiction that nobody will be able to look up to. That's what the enemy is saying to Hezekiah right now. That's what he's saying to the people, and that's what the enemy loves to throw in our faces. You're saying one thing with your mouth. You're teaching other people to do this, but you know that you're doing something else. You're just a hypocrite and you should quit. Hell no, church. Amen. Not true, church. Verse 23. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you could put riders on them. How can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you are depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. You see, it's bad enough that the enemy wants you to look at your own sin and feel shame for it. It's bad enough that the enemy wants to make you feel like a hypocrite and you will never actually grow. It's bad enough that the enemy wants you to misinterpret the things you did for the Lord. But what's even worse is the enemy will begin to make you think that these are actually God's thoughts in your mind. To make you actually believe, you know, this is, man, this is how God feels about me. I must be a pretty screwed up Christian that God thinks about me this way. But you know where you didn't get that? The word of God. 
You know where you didn't get that? From your pastors. You didn't get that from your brothers. These are lies from the enemy that he is trying to set himself up, masquerade as an angel of light to get you to believe that all of these lies in your mind are actually God's thoughts. And it couldn't be any further from the truth. Verse 26, then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to the field commander, please speak to your servants in Aramaic since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the commander replied, was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the men sitting on the wall who, like you, will have to eat their own filth and drink their own urine? Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. How about when the enemy uses holy language to destroy you, to break your confidence in your will, a weapon of truth as a weapon of a lie. When he uses things like, we know not to shrink back. And he puts it in your mind, haven't you shrank back? <laughs> haven't, haven't you shrank back in a situation when you knew you weren't supposed to? Well, the word says this. What's happening? You see, it's not all that unfamiliar. Je Jesus went through the same thing where the devil tried to use scripture to condemn him. You see, what happens all the time is you do something for the Lord, and then the enemy begins to mask his voice in your mind as holy language. You take a stand for the Lord. You take a stand against your lost relatives. You say, this is the line. We're not crossing it. And then the enemy begins to tell you, well, that wasn't very loving. That wasn't very Christ-like. What is the enemy doing? He's using holy language to mask his voice and to rob you of your confidence. How about this one? You're patiently waiting for God. And the enemy tells you, yeah, you're not... You're not producing enough for the kingdom, though. But you know that you're supposed to be patiently waiting. That is the enemy using holy language to mask its voice and rob you of your confidence in what God is actually saying. We move on to verse 30. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own cistern. Until I come and take you to a land like your own. What? Oh, exile will be fun. A land of grain and new wine. A land of bread and vineyards. A land of olive trees and honey. Hey, by the way, the word says where they're already dwelling is that. Choose life and not death. Who, who else do you know said that? God. But this Assyrian is saying, choose life and not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. You see, this is another attack of the enemy that all of us are prone to and we don't recognize. Hey, if you just give up, you'll be way more comfortable. If you just stop trying, man, you'll be way more at ease. If you just don't try at all, it won't be that hard. You will be more comfortable. You'll have everything you need. You'll have more rest. You'll have more sleep. If you just stop fighting as hard as you're fighting right now. If you just sit down on that couch and take more snacks to the face, you'll feel better about yourself. No, you won't. <laughs> no snacks don't. Snacks to Satan. Don't try to make shalom in your home. Your wife will never listen to you. She'll just rebel. Yeah. You Don't, won't be able to pastor your wife. You won't be able to lead her. You won't be able to direct her and guide her in everything that she's called to do. You might as well just sit down and take it easy. No, don't discipline your kids. They'll hate you for it. See, the enemy loves to throw comfort your way and tempt you with it to get you to stop trying. 
If you don't try, it'll just be easier. So just don't. Come with me. Well, I'll give you everything that you need. I'll give you a little bit more sleep. I'll give you a little bit more rest. I'll give you a little bit more absence of hostility in your home. It is all a lie of the enemy, church. But that's not our trajectory. 33. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharim, Hena, and Iva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land for me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Some weighty words right there. That's something he don't know what he's talking about. This idea of what you are facing and up against, it's impossible. It's impossible. Nobody's been able to do this. You won't be able to do it. How about those times when we think in ourselves, our lives, what I'm facing, nobody knows how difficult that is. Nobody knows the struggle I'm facing. They don't understand it. They're, that's something completely different. It's a lie. They don't know what I'm going through. They can, they've never experienced this. They have no idea. All of these lies, all of them trying to get you to stay and shrink back into where you are instead of moving where you're called. No God has been able to deliver somebody out of this. You know that's equivalent to? What I'm struggling with, nobody's ever done what I've done. Nobody's ever struggled like I've struggled. Nobody's ever had to do what I've had to do. Nobody's ever had more difficulty and had to overcome more. See, that is a lie from the enemy. That is a total lie to cause you to give up, ruin your confidence, and just not try. But we're going to make a turn on that. Verse 36, we see the king step in. Verse 36, the same king who trusted in the Lord, but the same king who actually caused this problem by becoming a servant to, to the Assyrian king, the same king who brought all this upon Jerusalem, he's going to stand up in confidence. And he, in verse 36, but the people remained silent and said nothing in reply. Because the king had commanded, do not answer him. The king looked at the people and said, hey, this conversation that's going on, don't even respond. These voices that are calling out, don't talk back to it. Quit entertaining these voices. Quit listening to it. Don't have that conversation. You see, this is happening in Jerusalem, but it happens in the space between our ears every single day. You need to know something that it, up here, this is your mind. You are alone in here 24 hours a day. Nobody is backing you up in here. Your brothers can't hear what's going on in here. Your pastors can't hear what's going on. You know what's going on in here? You are alone and you are the only one having these conversations in your mind. And you know what the devil is doing all of the time? He is flooding your mind with voices and thoughts like these so that you actually begin to entertain the conversation. And the answer is don't. Stop talking with that voice. Yeah. Stop talking and responding to what that voice is saying in your head. Yeah. That battle in your, if you can control your mind by the word of God, you can control everything in your life. You can control your body. You can control everything that you do if you can just control this space. If you could just hear that conversation and say, yes, yeah, shut up. That's not true. I am going to do the will of God and I will not back down. Yeah. You're going to win. The difference between uh, the difference between many many different people, many different athletes, different uh, team sports, individual sports, you can name anything. Uh, the difference between people that are good and great are the ones who learn how to overcome their mind. Mm -hmm. Half the time, it's not it's not a physical battle. Half the time, it's not about how much stamina you have, how great you are, how how high you can jump, how bad how good you can dribble a basketball. The battle that we wrestle with, the one thing that we have to overcome are the thoughts in here. And you know what? Your pastors, your elders, your brothers, they can't help you if you're by yourself. 
They cannot help you if you are isolating yourself. We need our brothers, and our brothers need us. Yeah, if you keep isolating yourself, you you will inevitably lose every time. Because those voices, the enemy does not stop. What we've learned already is that he knows us by name. He knew them by name. He knows everything, and he works harder than we do, by the way, to get us to quit. He fills that space in your mind over. That's why you can go to bed, like I said, and feel like a champion in the kingdom, but wake up in the morning with this random thought, and you just feel off. Why? Because that's not your thought. The enemy is trying to cripple you before you even wake up. So if we go to 2 Kings 19 and verse 5. When King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, tell your master, this is what the Lord says. Do not, isn't it so good when we hear, this is what the Lord says. There's nothing better when we're in worship and someone's prophesying and the words we hear, this is what the Lord says. What confidence. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings, underlings, that's great wording, of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Yeah. That's right, Michael. This should have fixed it. This should have fixed it. This, do not be afraid of what you have heard. God said this because he knew what was going to be happening. Why would he say, don't be afraid if there wasn't a situation coming up that we are going to be afraid of? Okay? Don't be afraid means something terrifying is coming. And he's giving them this confidence and reassurance before that even goes to happen. Yeah, if you ever hear, don't be afraid, you know it's coming. And here's what's coming in 2 Kings 19. If you skip to 19, verse 9, we're going to read the 13. Now, Sennacherib received a report that Terhaka, the Cushite king of Egypt, was marching out to fight against him. So he again sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word. Now, what is going on? The Assyrian king is in Judah, and he is trying to besiege Jerusalem. But while he's doing that, another king from Egypt comes to attack him. He is now in a moment where he's like, wow, I am very far from my homeland. My resources are stretched out. I am here to besiege a city. Now I'm getting attacked from another side. And this is what he does. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, don't let the God you depend on deceive you when he says, Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Surely you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my forefathers deliver them? The gods of Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who are in Tel Asar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, or of Hena, or Eva? What is going on here is that the enemy knows that he's going to lose. The enemy knows that it's over for him. He is about to get attacked from another army, and he is in a foreign land. This is the point where the enemy has nothing to lose now. And this is when he is the most relentless. He knows his defeat is near, so he is kicking this attack into overdrive. Do you know that this is the worst kind of enemy, church? An enemy with nothing to lose? See, this is exactly the devil's position with you, church. He knows his time is short. He knows he's going to lose. He knows the end of the book. And so what is he trying to do? He is trying as hard as he can to be the most relentless he can and take whoever he can with him. He is trying with everything to just get some of the faithful to throw in the towel. He is an enemy that has nothing to lose. That is why when what is going on right now in Eastern Europe with our church what is going on there is a breakthrough in the kingdom, and we see difficulties and hardships here. It's because the enemy knows he's losing, and he's going to try everything he can to wither our confidence. But guess what? He knows he's about to lose. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to 2 Kings 19 and verse 20. Then, man, that's so good. Then. 
Isaiah, son of Amaz, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have heard your prayer concerning Sennacherib, king of Assyria. This is what the Lord has spoken against him. The virgin daughter of Zion despises you and mocks you. The daughter of Jerusalem tosses her head as you flee. Tosses her head. Who is it you have insulted and blasphemed? Against whom have you raised your voice and lifted your eyes in pride? Against the Holy One of Israel. This is the big moment, church. God answers the enemy's question. On what are you basing your confidence? God is identifying himself with his people. This is the basis for their confidence and for our confidence. When we realize who God is, it changes everything. Everything. It allows our minds to focus on possibilities rather than the impossibilities. Identity is the key. We are more. Oh, see, church, I don't think you're getting it. You see, what changes everything is when you know your identity is his identity. You see, when you don't know that, the enemy begins to spread lies in your mind, and you begin to doubt that you can even do it. And you begin to even doubt that God can do it through you. Oh, but when you are attached, when you are focused, when you are in love, when you are so close to his identity, and you know his identity is you, it starts to change things. When you hear these lies, you go, ah, 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 no, 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 no. My God is the King of Kings. My God is worthy of praise. My God is the highest of all gods, and I am in him. Therefore, I will no longer ask, what if I don't make it? I'll no longer ask, can I do this? I'll no longer ask, what if I fall on my face and fail? Instead, I'm going to ask the question, what if God moves in my life and we whoop this thing? What if God, the King of Kings, begins to pour out his spirit on me and we go to work and we actually get this thing? What if it is possible that I win? You see, when you know who your God is, you begin to know who you are, church. Many times we lose focus of who the King is and we lose focus of our own identity. And those lies begin to, begin to become more uh, real and louder than the voice of God in your life. But when we cry out and we attach ourselves, like Romans 8, 15, when God says, they're not attacking you, they're attacking me because you are mine. Yeah. Romans 8, 15 through 16 says, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. By him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Amen. It is at that moment when you are in desperation crying out to God that his spirit speaks to your spirit and that small voice begins to say, you are my son. Stop living like this. Stop believing that. See, when God does that, you don't need a man to tell you you are his son. It's great. I've been there many times where I've forgotten it and the pastors have told me and I'm like, hallelujah, I forgot but it's those moments when God speaks to you and the world didn't give that to you and the world can't take that away. Yeah. No man said that to you. No man can take that away. The enemy didn't say that to you. The enemy can't take it away. It is those moments when you cry to him and he speaks to your heart and says, you are my son. Stop listening to the voices of the enemy. You are my son. You are more than this church. How about when, when God smiles down on you and you smile back? There's nothing worse to the enemy when you get a big old grin on your face. Why? Because you recognize whose you are. That's, that's real country right there. Whose you are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That dog will hunt. Yeah. <laughs> Philippians 3, 7. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Paul makes every attempt to be found in Christ. 
His thoughts are founded in him. Every attempt in his identity is to be founded in him. Everything else that he had before is rubbish. It's gone. Everything he wants is that he is founded, grounded in who Christ is. That's where his strength is, church. That's where our strength is. When we cement ourselves to the foundational piece, the rock, that is where we have our strength. Amen. See, I love that he says, not having a righteousness of my own, but that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Paul's not looking to justify himself, and he knows in that moment he's not perfect. He knows he has no righteousness of, of his own, but he is seeking to be found in him. He is seeking with everything. I want my identity to be in his identity. I want my strength to be found in his strength. I want my courage to be found in him. My confidence, I want it to be found in him. See, that is the mark of a man who knows this battle well and is seeking to fight with everything that he has to find his identity in the Lord. And I want to say the man who seeks that with that desperation, you will find your identity in the Lord. You will find it. God will speak to you. Psalm 27, verse 1 through 3 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me in my flesh, in my mind, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then, I will be confident. You see what's going on in this passage? We found a note in the NET. It led us to the Hebrew words, the Hebrew verbs. These Hebrew verbs are all in past tense in this passage. Mm -hmm. So when it says, when evil men advance against me, David's really saying, when evil men advanced against me when my enemies and my foes attacked me they stumbled and fell what david is doing here is he's reflecting probably on first samuel 17 and goliath though an army come against me they stumbled and fell what he is doing is in the midst of di difficulty he's looking back and seeing what god has already done in his life what God has already conquered, and that is allowing him to know that he can be confident in the darkness he's sitting in now. God did it before, and he will do it again. See, that's that place you go to in your mind where you remember, God showed up. He revealed his identity to me. He spoke, whatever I'm going through right now, I know what God did in my heart. I know what he did in 2008. Nobody could take that away. I saw the power with which God moved on my heart, and I know that he can do it again. I'm struggling with this offense, whatever, but I know God can change it in my heart. Yeah. Man, I rem this is like doing your remembers. Man, I remember when I cried because groceries came through the threshold of, my flo of, of our house because we had nothing. Man, I remember when I was sitting with my wife, and we thought our one-week-old daughter was going to die. And we looked at each other and we said, you know what? Whether she dies or not, we are going to give glory to God and we're not going to fear and we're going to keep moving. And God healed her. Man, I remember when I felt so helpless and alone and then God gave me a team. I remember struggling, not thinking I would ever make it anywhere in the kingdom. People told me that I would never amount to anything and look what God has done. See, it's that part of you. When you are struggling with something that feels so real, it feels like it has never been this difficult. It's that moment when you look back and say, no, God did this. Man, he did this. Man, I remember when he showed off, and in fact, he revealed to me a piece of his character, a piece of his identity, and I took that with me, and it formed me, and God's going to crush this thing right now. It's when that conversation goes off in your head, man. You go to that place and go, nah. I remember I survived all that stuff. I'm going to survive this now and then. Yeah. Oh, man. All right, let's go to Judges 15, verse 16. Samson then said, With the jawbone of a donkey, I have left them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I have struck down a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw the jawbone down and named that place Ramoth Lehi. He was very thirsty. So he cried out to the Lord and said, You have given your servant this great victory. 
But now must I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the Philistines? So God split open the basin at Lehi and water flowed out from it. When he took a drink, his strength was restored and he revived. For this reason, he named the spring Anhakor. It remains in Lehi to this very day. Samson led Israel for 20 years during the days of the Philistine prominence. Samson's identity was to kill Philistines. And he was good at it. Yeah, he, was. He, was, he was real good at it. Now, what we see in this, in this passage, though, he does function in his identity. But what happens when we function in our identity? And we are worn out. We are fatigued beyond measure. We do what Samson did. He cried out to the Lord. He sought his strength, his stronghold. And what did God do? He delivered him. He delivered him and poured out water supernaturally to give him life again. Amen. Life to revive him back onto his feet. Why? Because his identity wasn't done and there are more Philistines to kill. Yeah. Where in our lives, we feel dry and we cry out to the Lord. You know why? Because there's more work to be done. Yeah. There is more work to be done, church. The kingdom is advancing. Man, Luke 16, 16, I'm looking at Spencer. The kingdom is advancing. You know, and you know what Samson didn't do? He didn't believe the lie that said, well, because you killed all those Philistines with the donkey jawbone, you could just take it easy. You could just coast. You're good now. You don't need to prepare for the next thing. You don't need to prepare for the next trial. You don't need to keep pushing, man. You, you did it. You did it. Honestly speaking, if... God used me to kill a bunch of Philistines with a donkey jawbone, I'd feel pretty good about myself. I'd be like, man, I'm done. Like, this has to be what I'm called to do right here. But that's not what Samson does. He gets right back to that place where it's just him and God, and he cries out. And God opens up an empty place in his life. He gets right back to that spot where he wants to interact with God's character because he needs to find his identity anew. Man, that's gold, isn't it? Let's go to 1 Chronicles 28, 20. David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. What is awesome about this is a generational aspect that we're bringing. This generational aspect of David, who's standing up in his identity, knows and trusts in God. We already looked at that in Psalm 27. We know that he's already reflecting on these things. Now he's reflecting on it, and he's passing that generationally down to his son. My God will be with you the same way he was with me. He is pouring out to him, encouraging him. He says again, don't be afraid. Why? Because the enemy is going to try to bring fear into his life. Why about not being discouraged? Because he's clearly going to bring discouragement. But David's assuring him, my God is your God. My rock is going to be your rock. My king will be your king. And he will not fail you until all of the work is finished. Amen. These are things that I, as a father, want to pour into my four sons. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> That's right. Come on. The kingdom is advancing. So what's so awesome that we're seeing in this passage, and it's all of our goals, is God has called us to be confident. We know the basis of our confidence. And what David is doing is David has, re he had a life, both of victory and failure. But David knew. David knew that he gave it everything that he had, and he fought time and time with the enemy. And David found the basis of his confidence in God, and he went to war against the enemy. He, he ended his life in confidence and victory, overcoming the voices in his mind. And now he's leaving that legacy for his sons. You say, that's the goal in this church. That's the goal in this body for all of us to leave a legacy of our sons of victory. What do you think it does to your sons when they see you lacking in confidence? 
What do you think it does to your sons when they see you give up? They will develop a habit of giving up. But when they see you press through, despite all opposition, no matter what the voices are saying in our heads, no matter how much fear is involved, they see you press through, they're going to do the same thing. And that's what David's doing here. He's passing on that legacy of confidence and victory to his son. We see in 2 Chronicles 22, verse 10 through 12, the same thing, but from husband to wife. We won't read this entire passage, but we see that Jehosheba, Jehosheba is the wife of Jehoiada. And what she does is because Jehoiada is a warrior, Jehoiada is a man who does not let opposition stop him. He does not let the voices of the enemy get to his head. He goes to war time and time again. His wife picks up the same mantle, and his wife picks up the same spear. Yeah. Not literally. But what his wife does is in a difficult circumstance, man, she does exactly what her husband would do. You see, husbands, this mentality is not just for you. This mentality of overcoming, this mindset of going to war with the voices in your head is not just for you. It is for your children and it's for your wives. Amen. When you stand up in that confidence, it does something. Confidence breeds confidence, church. And I'm not, I've been called arrogant, I've been called cocky, I've been called so many things. But you know what? I know I won't quit. And I know I won't fail to try. I know I won't look at something and say, I can't do that. Because I know who my God is. And I know because he is my God and he is with me, I will try. If I die, I will try. What this is not is arrogance and cockiness. This is confidence in who God is. And it reaches everyone around you. Your wives, your children, everyone around you. And your brothers. Nehemiah 4.14. After I looked things over, I stood up. And said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Come on. Nehemiah, in his identity, stands up to opposition. A man who comes back to help rebuild Jerusalem and to inspire the men around him. He stands up. And the first thing he does reminds him not to be afraid. And then speaks about remembering who God is. Why? Because that's his king. That's their king. That's what they stand upon. That's their stronghold. That is their identity. When they remember who God is, they remember who they are. And that's what the strength and the power comes from. What they do after this, they begin to take hold of that confidence and nothing stops them. The verse after talks about the enemies heard what they were doing. And we're afraid. They were afraid. They stopped advancing in that moment. Because the confidence was there. They were on the move. That is exactly what, what we do, church. What I want you guys to get from this. How about those times when you stand up around your brothers. And you walk in your identity. When you are not walking in your identity... We are lacking something. I mean, as a body, when Noan Hewitt is not standing up in his identity, we all, as a body, are lacking. But you know what Noan Hewitt is going to be doing and is doing? He's standing up in his identity, and we are blessed abundantly because of it. Bonnie, you are standing up in your identity. You are a compassionate shepherd, and I love the way that you build your house. They are better because of it. And we all as a body are better because of it. We can go around the room and do the exact same thing. And if we, didn't have, if we had more time, guarantee we would do it. It's the identity. Why? Because it's, it's what we are called to do. And us standing up here right now is our identity. Is speaking, opening up our mouth and telling you the good news that we are taking hold of, and we're transferring that to you. We're confident 
that we are going to be getting up, standing up, walking our identity because it's the first part of setting out. And we are already beginning to do this. And oh man, when we start to grab hold of this more and more, as we are, we are going to be unstoppable, church. So the number one thing that we want to crush tonight is the thought, I can't. It's the number one thing. I was telling Adam as we were preparing for this message, one of the number one things that really just gets down in my soul that hurts me the most is when I see people that I love give up on themselves. When I see people that I love the most quit before they even try. When I have people that I love say, I can't do it, when I know they can do it. When I know it's deep down inside of them, but they've already canceled themselves out. And that comes from a long time of listening to the voice of the enemy in their minds and entertaining it and having that conversation over and over. And it frustrates me to no end, not, not the person, not any person, but the fact that I know there's more potential. Like I know we are more. I know I am more. I was showing Adam uh, earlier, there's a picture that I just love. It's a, it's a statue where there is a fat, really fat man, a really fat man, like from the feet up. And the top half is a ripped, chiseled dude. And what he's doing is like the ripped, chiseled dude is inside the fat guy, and he's chiseling away at the fat guy underneath him. See, that inspires me. You know, in the kingdom of God, there comes something from knowing who you are in Christ, and you know deep down inside it's in there, and because you know what's in there, man, you fight. I'm going to chisel this away. Yeah. I don't look the way I want to on the outside. I'm not where I want to be, but I am going to chisel this away because I know it's on the inside of me. And that comes from hearing the voice of God. I had a, one of my best friends. I was at the gym with him the other day. And he hadn't been to the gym in, in a year. I walked up to him, and he was working out. And he began to, he began to look at me, and he began to say, man, I... I used to be able to do a lot more than this, and I'm just struggling right now with it. And I saw the look on his face. I saw the look on his face. I saw the embarrassment that he had, knowing that he was struggling with something that was lesser than what he used to conquer. That hurt me. That made me want to look at my friend and say, hey, man, stop that. Quit thinking about my friend like that, man. Quit thinking about my brother like that. It doesn't matter what you're doing right now. You are here at the gym. You know how many people are not, but you are here. I know that's just the gym, but we got to start thinking of ourselves like that, church. It doesn't matter where you're at right now. You are here, and you have God on your side. You have a spirit inside of you. You can do it. Our last scripture is Mark 9, 17 through 23. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Listen to this man for a second. I'm being robbed. My family's being robbed. My kids are being robbed. And I can't do anything about it. Verse 18, whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Could you imagine being in that position? Man, I brought it. We prayed about it. And nothing is changing. Man, I've, I've asked the Lord to change me and nothing is changing. Then Jesus responds. Oh, unbelieving generation. Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Notice Jesus not, is not mad at the man. Jesus is upset at the fact of his disbelief. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. This is a problem that's always been there. It's been there as long as I can remember, and I've never been able to conquer it. It's been eating my lunch every day. I feel like I get victory for three months, and then it comes back. 
It'll never get fixed. It's been there since childhood. This is leftover from whenever I was a kid and all the damage that was done to me. This is leftover from everything bad that's happened to me in life. And it's never been fixed. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can do anything, Jesus, please take pity on our situation. Oh, the King of Kings wants to do a whole lot more than yeah, just take does. pity. The Father wants to do a lot more than just take pity on your situation, church. Look at Jesus' response. If you can, said Jesus, if you can, excuse me, if you can, you must have forgot who you're talking to, son. You must have forgot my identity. You must have forgot who I am. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. I wish I had a better theological way to say that. I wish I had a, like a complicated or, or a nice little poem to say about that verse to help us understand it more. But it is what it is. He said, everything is possible for him who believes. Everything. What does everything mean? Everything. everything is possible. You can be free. You can over, you can start doing that new thing that you thought you couldn't do. You realize that every new thing that somebody's ever, ever been done, they haven't done before. Did Charles Edison invent the light bulb before he invented the light bulb? It's all new. We're all trying new things. Everything is possible in the kingdom of God for those who believe. Believe in what? Believe who your God is. Believe that he's with you. Believe that he's placed you here. Believe that he's given you something. That he has created you and formed you fearfully in the womb. And that he's put his spirit inside of you, not around you, inside of you. Everything is possible for him who believes. You see, I don't know what this man's name is. In fact, I actually do. I know who this guy is. I know who this guy is in this passage. This guy is Justin Treister. Because he's saying to Jesus, if you can do anything, which is, the basic, which is basically saying, I don't think you can do it. I don't think you can do this. What I'm seeing now is way more impossible than what I think you can do. Which is, in fact, him saying, I don't think I can do this. I don't, think, I don't think anybody could do this. You see, this man has an I can't attitude. That's me. This man has lost the knowledge of who Jesus is, or never had it, and he cannot wrap his mind around what Jesus can do, what him and Jesus can accomplish. See, I'm that man. I am the man said things like, I can't be good enough. I can't be good enough to reach, to gain, to inherit everything God has said. I can't do enough. I've said that. I can't do enough to bring this about. I can't get holy enough. I can't reach where I want to be. I don't have enough energy. I don't have enough energy to do what God's calling me to do. I don't have enough sleep. I don't have enough rest. I just feel tired all the time. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough free time. I don't have enough free time to pastor my kids and my wife and, and show up at the, the meetings and be discipled and actually engage and teach foundation, all this stuff to go to work. I don't have enough free time. I'm not good at studying the word. I'm just not, I'm, so, I'm just not like Wade. I'm just, I can't do it. I'll never be able to pray like I want to. I'll never, I've tried, I can't. I'll never be a good enough husband. 
Seems like I keep messing it up. I will never be a good enough husband for my wife. I will never raise kids who are better than me. I keep trying with whatever limited capacity I have, and they keep sinning. I'll never raise kids who are better than me. In fact, what the pastors are doing is an anomaly. I can't do it. I don't have all the answers I need. When people ask questions about their life, I don't have it. I don't have the finances I need to accomplish God's will. Everyone thinks I'm a failure. Why is it always difficult and never easy? How about this one? I'm too old to do this. I am too old. I'm gone. I'm checking out. I can't do this. I will never reach where I'm going. I can't be like the pastors. In fact, everybody must think I'm an idiot. You know, man, it's not just you. The ladies, my kids will never grow into godliness. I will never be able to please my husband. I'll never find a husband. I'll never be married. Nobody sees the efforts that I put in. Nobody sees how hard I work. Everyone thinks I'm terrible. And they only see the bad things inside of me, even when I'm trying not to reveal it. I can't be like Miss Cass, Miss Christy, Miss Jen, Natalie Arizina, Miss Joe. I can't be like Joy Dang. I can't be like Sam, Sasha, or Hannah. It's just not possible for me. All of those thoughts are thoughts from the enemy. But when I ask you this question, who told you that? Who told you that you can't do these things? Who told you that you can't study the word like the pastors? Who put that in your mind? Who lied to you and said that you can't be like the pastors, that your kids will never grow and be godly? Who told you that, church? It wasn't God. It wasn't your pastors. It wasn't your brother. Who told you that? You know who told you that? You told you that. You have been lying to yourself and telling you you can't do it. And that's why you quit before you even try. You have been telling yourself and lying to yourself. And that's why we don't see the results that we want. Because we listen to that voice that comes from the enemy. And we begin to accept it as our own voice. We begin to actually think that it's God's voice. It's my voice. I should be thinking this. You know, it's just true. I'm just not going to try. And that is the most devilish thing that Satan has ever done to his, his kingdom. Right now, if you are a person, man, woman, child, daughter, mother, son, brother, grandfather, grandmother, if you're a person in this room and you've been hearing the thoughts of the enemy in your mind and you've accepted them and you've actually lied to yourself and told yourself that you can't do it, you've bought into this about anything in your life. I don't care what it is about anything in your life. Anything kingdom related, job related. If you have bought into that lie and you've told yourself, I can't do this, I might as well just quit or I might as well just give up, stand to your feet. Just about all of us. I'm standing too. What you need to know right now is you're a victor. You standing up is not an embarrassment. You standing up right now is one of the strongest things that you can ever do in the kingdom. And it's acknowledged this has been happening. It's acknowledged that I've been buying into this lie. If you've ever felt embarrassed about your performance, it's because you bought into the lie already. You are allowing the devil to just to lie to you, and you start lying to yourself. You are the victor right now because right now you're standing to your feet in acknowledgement, and you're saying, now I can make the change. If you're standing, let's come to this altar, and what we're going to do is we're going to do what Romans 8 says. The fix 
is allowing God to speak to you his identity. Allowing God to speak to you your identity because your identity is in him. Allowing God to testify to your spirit that you are a son. Allowing God and actually believing, I am more than this. I will not settle for low living. That's in our creed. I will not settle for low living because I am a son of God. I will not give up. I will not quit. I will not make excuses. I will not let myself, the kingdom down by giving up before it's too early. I will not make up things that, oh, well, God didn't tell me to do this when in fact you said God told you to do this just because it got hard. Now you're saying you didn't. Instead, what happens is we're gonna ask God for him to breathe on us. We're gonna ask God to speak to our hearts. We're gonna ask for that voice of God to come into our hearts and minds for him to flood our hearts and reveal to us the son that we are and the father that we serve because that will change it. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we ask that you would pour out revival in our hearts, Lord God. Lord, who you are. Lord, let us remember all of the wonderful things that you have already done, what we know you will do because you're a good father to us. Lord God, revive in us who we are because of who you are. Lord, we cry out to you, Abba Father. We are your sons. We are your children. Lord, stir in our hearts again, Lord God. Bring us back to life in confidence and assurance, Lord, of what you've called us to do. We find our identity in you, mighty King, and nothing else. We will not waver. We will stand firm on the foundation that you have set us on. We love you, mighty King.